Hey everyone, it's Dr. Jeff. On the Dr. Jeff Show, I interview major thought leaders in all different fields to demonstrate that worldview changes everything. On this episode, I interview Steve Dace. He's a talk show host. He dives into today's issues fearlessly and he's quickly become a powerful national voice fighting against the mainstream media narrative, big tech censorship through Blaze TV. Christians who get involved are facing growing attacks. They are called names, they face shaming, they're getting canceled. And the big question is, what are we supposed to do now? If you're wondering that, then I think you'll find this episode of The Dr. Jeff Show one of the most bracing bits of time that you could invest. Hey, Steve Deese, welcome to The Dr. Jeff Show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Of course, I'm familiar with the work of Summit Ministries. I've encountered some of your past students in my line of work. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, perfect. Well, I'm really looking forward to our conversation because your story is amazing. You've you've become an influential voice. You're bringing common sense and boldness. My wife, Stephanie, and I were just watching one of your shows last night, and you brought them into the cultural conversation at the craziest time in, in my 55 years. So a lot of your story, though... It, and a lot of people may not pick this up on every on the shows that you do, but a lot of your story, Steve, goes back to 2003. And you had a life-changing experience at a Promise Keepers <laughs> event that set the whole trajectory of your life in motion. I'd love to just dive right in with that story. Sure. I, I'm a kid. I was born to a 15-year-old mom. Actually, today is her birthday uh, that we are recording this. But uh, I was born to a 15-year-old mom. Um, who got pregnant from a high school senior boyfriend of some means. She was considered poor white trash at the time. And um, her, his parents wanted her to get an abortion. Well, you know, it was illegal at the time, but when you were of means, you could make something happen in those days. Um, she wasn't sure she could bring herself to do it. And then, and she, so she found out she's pregnant with me at Christmas. And then about a month later, Roe v. Wade happens. And now she has a choice to do it safe, legal, and rare, so to speak. And in the end, she just couldn't bring herself to do it and ends up becoming a single mom and giving birth to me when she's 15 years old uh, in July. And I, you know, I, I was on ADC food stamps as a kid. I remember eating government cheese. I remember doing reduced lunches. She ended up marrying a young man out of the Navy a few years when I was about three, four years old. And there was a lot of good things about him. It's where I get my last name. Uh, he taught me a lot about work ethic and things of that nature, but he also came from a very abusive background. His father was an alcoholic and was very physically and emotionally abusive to him. And so at times when, when he would abuse uh, marijuana or, or alcohol, he would treat us that way as well. You know, in my, in my family, we had very high highs, you know, every amusement park you can imagine. And we've had very low lows, you know? And yeah. so it's out of this background that I'm now doing uh, talk radio uh, in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm doing sports talk radio, actually. And, um, but the, the news talk station here in town, WHO, is grooming me to eventually take over the news talk station. And we have our first child uh, in 2001. And bringing her home made me just this overwhelming feeling of inadequacy. Like this kid has no chance with me as a dad. I didn't have the greatest model. And after a while I go to my wife and I'm like, you know, this is going to sound weird coming from me, but and I think we're fine, but maybe Hillary Clinton's right about this one. It's going to take a village to raise this kid. You know, we, we, we maybe need to look at joining a church. And Amy was like, well, I kind of was thinking that way for a long time. I just didn't have the guts to say something to you about it. So I'm kind of glad you said something to me. And, and because of the fact I was involved in political circles um, in high school and college uh, and was very politically aware, I kind of knew, I guess, who we would say the liberal denominations were. I didn't know what why they were liberal theologically. I just knew they were liberal politically, right? And I, and so like anybody that was involved in like the National Council of Churches, I just eliminated all of those churches in my town. So I, I went to my sports talk audience and asked them for suggestions um, of churches that didn't belong to these left-wing organizations. I got several examples and I tried to interview as many of the pastors as I could. I asked them all a really, th this classic gotcha question. So 
if only people that believe in Jesus go to heaven, what about the guy in the aboriginal forest of Australia who a missionary never reached and he died saving a bus full of kids? Is he in hell right now? I wanted to, I was, I wanted to know what everybody's answer was. And one pastor said to me, he goes, I trust a God who would spare not even his own son on my behalf to deal justly with such a unique occurrence. Wow. Such a good answer that I went to, we started going to that church. And my wife took it right away. I was very standoffish. And after a few months, they started running an ad for Promise Keepers, that they were going to go to Kansas City for Promise Keepers that September. And I just had this overwhelming feeling that no matter what else was going on on planet Earth on September 18th, 2003, I had to be at Kemper Arena in Kansas City for this event. Yeah, yeah. Now, for our younger viewers, Steve, uh, uh, Promise Keepers yeah. was a from 1993 to, into the 2000s was was the call to Christian manhood, to fatherhood, mm -hmm. to being godly men, and they met in arenas all over the United States of America. And so you went to the one at Kemper Arena, Kansas City, mm -hmm. and what happened? Mm -hmm. It just it changed my life. I didn't want to go. I tried the, the week of the event. I tried to come up with a million excuses not to go. My wife uh, finally planted me in the car, dropped me off at the drop-off point, just drove off and said, see you in a few days. And so I get on the bus and I've got the universal dude symbol for don't talk to me. I got my headphones in. That's before earbuds, kids, okay? And, and I'm kind of known now because my sports talk show is popular. And a guy is sitting in, in the row ahead of me on the bus to Kansas City and he keeps looking at me. And I can tell he wants to talk to me. But I keep doing the diss. I'm not making eye contact. I don't want to talk to him. Finally, he taps me on the knee and he goes, I don't know why, but I think I need to tell you this. And he starts telling me his life story. And it's a lot of the same struggles with, it, with that I had been having in my own life. And at first it was weird, but by the time we got to Kansas City, I mean, we were like brothers. We're still friends to this day. And we get to the arena and they start playing the music and stuff. And I'm watching guys hold hands and I'm like, no, no, <laughs> not doing this. Okay. And then the, the first speaker gets up and it's a guy named Joe White. And he starts giving this presentation with three crosses on the stage. And he starts talking about who the other two guys at the, on this stage were. And, and I'm listening to this message. And he talks about the damage that fathers do to their sons when they either don't hold them accountable or affirm them at the exact same time. And I'm looking around this arena. There's 10, 12, 13,000 guys in here. And it's like this entire message was, was scheduled just for me. For you. And, and at the end, he takes an altar call. And I'm like, man, altar calls are really for only really bad Pentecostal television. I'm not answering this, okay? And and before I know it, and I was, you know, like 400 pounds back then. I was a really large dude. Before I know it, next thing I know, I'm out of the chair and I'm face down on the concrete floor at Kemper Arena answering this altar call. And my wife would tell you ever since then, she's uh, this is her second marriage. It's just with the guy had the same name both times. It has not been perfect. I've made plenty of mistakes. I make plenty of mistakes, but here's what it has been. It's been different. Hmm. What do you, what, what's that look like? I mean, it, because people say I'm different and then you watch it for a little bit and you're like, uh, you may feel different, but I don't see, you don't treat people differently. You still mm -hmm. interact in the office in the same way. What are some of the things that your wife would, oh, this puts you on the spot. What would she say the difference really is? I think that what she would say is um, a level of accountability. My, when I've lost my temper or I've done something wrong, if I've, if I've been cross, if I've, if I've gone outside the bounds, uh, the rules of engagement of a typical argument with my wife, her and my children, they're all teenagers now, but when they were young, I mean, they would see me get on a knee and ask for their apology. I, I was wrong. Right? That's that's not what God want. How, that's not who God has called me to be. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? I think there's been a level of accountability, self awareness, uh, patience that I am not naturally gifted with by any stretch. You know, I played sports all my life, and I thought the f bomb was my name until about the seventh grade. All right, I mean, I was dog cussed all the time. You know, and so to to tolerate other people's mistakes, mine were never tolerated ever. So I, I always just assumed I had to be perfect at everything. Right. You know, and to tolerate mistakes, um, 
to make their own mistakes. I mean, these, these are these are all things that on my own, I just was not modeled and I am not equipped to do or to be. And uh, thankfully, my father in heaven filled the gap of, of that an earthly father left. But again, I'm, I'm not perfect at, here's, but here's what I try to do. Um, I, I try to keep my eye on the end goal. And the end goal for me is Jeff, if, if, if at the end, when they put me in the ground, if my children would come to my funeral and say about me as my children, what Paul said to Timothy, who was his spiritual child at the end of his race, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. If my kids can say, man, I saw the old man. I saw him with his knickers down figuratively and literally. I saw him when he showed his rear end. I saw him when he was not everything he pretended to be, but I saw him when he was for real at the exact same time. I knew him better than all of you. You guys know a public image. I knew Steve Dace, not, not a public image, the real guy. And I can sit here and tell you that despite all those moments, you know, this line had some ups and downs, had some jagged edges to it. But here at the end of this line, I can tell you that the old man, he fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. If my children will say that about me on my grave, then I am confident that the next words I will hear when I wake up will be well done, good and faithful servant. I try to stay my, my I don't, I'm not focused on the journey. I'm focused on the destination, on the end game. That's what I, when I lose, when I, when I fall into sin, Jeff, when I, when I lose my place, it's because I'm focused on what's going on right here and now. I'm focused on the journey. I lose my contentment. I get bored, right? I get bored with my wife. We've been married for 25 years. I get bored with the same house. I've lived in it for 15 years. I get bored with the same job. I've done it for how many years, right? I lose contentment when I'm focused on the journey. What brings me back into perspective and gets me back on the narrow road is when I put my mind back on the actual destination, on the end game. So when you start, you start from God's perspective and look back over everything else, then then you then that gives you the perspective for those trials, for the difficult situations, for those situations where you think, man, I was my worst, I was my own worst enemy in this in this situation. Uh, I love, I, by the way, Paul's words to Timothy. If anybody anybody who's watching this or listening to this. Just get out your Bible and read First Timothy and Second Timothy. It is an epistle for our times, right? For what God's called us to do, for the difficulty of the situations that we face, but also for how to live the good life. So, man, what a great story. Well, uh, but speaking of fighting the good fight, uh, you da- you daily do battle. And a lot of it's cult, the cult, what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the political realm. And I, I just have to ask you because, you know, all the students I work with at Summit Ministries, you know, they come in. What they have heard is that Jesus has nothing to do with politics. Mm-hmm. G- Christians don't get involved in this stuff. If they do, they're Christian nationalists or they're dominionists or whatever. They should feel ashamed about this. They should, they should repent of this. And I'm just curious because you're in this every single day. I mean, how, how do you grapple with that? One of my favorite movies when I was a little kid was War Games with Matthew Broderick. And it's a missionary tale about the nuclear, uh, you know, war hysteria of the 1980s, right? Just, okay, stop, stop right there real quick. I did show that to my children. I was horrified at how bad the language was that I didn't remember. So just parental warning. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> a lot of those movies in the 80s that our parents let us watch were like that. Yes. They were like that. I ended up creating the PG-13 rating later in the 80s. Yes. Yes. But the, the tagline of the film, the, the moral the, of, the, of the film is the only way to win the game is not to play. And, and I think the reason we struggle whether it's politics or pick any other industry or any other enterprise, uh, this side of heaven. The reason we struggle with how do I reconcile blank with my belief system is because we're trying to reconcile blank with my belief system. The only way to win the game is not to play. I don't try to reconcile my faith with how to be politically effective. I, I, I 
try instead to make political effectiveness accountable to my faith. I don't have to reconcile. They're not, they're not co-equal branches of, of worldview. They're, they're, they're not a symbiotic relationship. They're, they're not, uh, they're not uh, hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. And then I apply that same word for oneness in the Shema to my political activism and my world and my, my faith. No, the, the, my faith is up here. Everything else is below it. And so but whatever is below has to reconcile with what is above. So I don't, I don't try to reconcile those things. For me, I didn't know what I'm about to say is not easy. It's not easy, but it's simple. And that is, if this abides with my faith, my if I'm confident it does, my answer is yes. If I'm confident it does not, my, my answer is no. If I'm not sure, I don't have an answer. That's it. My master plan. Yeah. That's how I approach whether to vote, who to vote for. There's been times, frankly, I didn't think I any. I, there's been times I didn't think either people running were worthy of my vote, so I didn't vote for them. I don't do humanistic calculations that not voting for this is actually a vote for that because if that's the case, then you're then if I were to vote for that, then I voted for it twice. It doesn't make any. I, I don't belay, I don't do any of that utilitarian garbage. It's really simple to me. If I if I can give my audience a justification for why I'm doing something that I'm not ashamed of. And that if this was the last thing I said before God called me home and the mic went off, would I feel like I could look my savior in the eye and justify why I just used this platform he gave me to say that? Yes. Then I'm okay. Whether you like it or don't, I don't, I really don't. My staff will tell you, we spend, I, w- I don't want to say zero because we're human being. Okay. But the, the, um, the, the number percentage of time we spend wondering how people will receive what we think whether it will be liked, how far to push something, it is in the single digits as opposed to the amount of time we spend with, is this true? Can we be honest about this? Can we reconcile this? Can we justify this, et cetera? Yeah. As I'm, as I'm listening to that, Steve, I, I love that idea of your politics being accountable to your faith. And, I, and I, I, I'm thinking of a lot of my students who've gone into situations where they're in the military or they are in business or they mm-hmm. are in academia, got lots of students who are professors in PhD programs. Faculty meetings are horrible in this. I mean, you, if, you, if you say, I'm just gonna speak honestly in these situations, uh, that's, it's pretty tough to be frank. I mean, that's really difficult. And so I could, I could kind of see somebody saying, well, yeah, of course, Steve Dace can do this because you know he has a show and he can say whatever he wants and all of that. But when I'm around the water cooler at work, it doesn't work like that. Sure. You know, I get this a lot. Like yeah. I have had my career threatened. I can't tell you how many times, how many times, um, especially because I won't conform to paradigms. I don't believe in flawed binary choices. I don't believe in the lesser of two evils because it's a fallacy. Everything is the lesser of two evils. Could my wife marry a better looking, more righteous man? Yeah. So I'm the lesser of two evils. Okay. I mean, could the blaze find a better host? Sure. There's 7 billion people on planet earth. So they employed the lesser of two evils. Everything's the lesser of two evils. Therefore, nothing is because we're all evil, right? That's why we need a savior. So I don't, because I don't buy into these kinds of fallacies, I've had my career threatened umpteen times from both Republicans and Democrats. This past year, I was one of the very first people to really call horse pucky on these doomsday models when I examine them at places like Imperial College and the University of Washington's IHME models. I looked at their math, I looked at their algorithms, I looked at their data, logic and conclusions. It was clear they did not add up. At best, they were guessing. At worst, it was something, pardon the pun, nefarious. Um, And if I'm wrong about that, brother, and that's this is supposedly like the worst global pandemic ever, if I'm wrong about that, if I go on the air one day and my dad is not right and it costs somebody their life, my career is over. I'm never doing this again. So the idea that I'm just insulated from all of this kinds of scrutiny is just not accurate. I mean, I, because I'm leading with a biblical worldview, because I challenge conventional wisdoms all the time, literally any moment I color outside the lines and get a fact wrong, it could be, it was a nice run, Steve, have a nice life. So I just, I don't have much sympathy for that. I'm on a much bigger stage than your water cooler. I've had a lot of pastors tell me over the years, well, you know, my people come to me and they want to know why they don't hear 
from me what you say on your show. And I'm like, you know, on where you're at, you're in a tax deductible shelter. I mean, you, I'm not, I'm in a for-profit capitalistic venture. I've got to reach a much broader audience with a narrow message than you do. And often the people come to you. They, 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 they often come to you. I'm lost. I, I, I lost a loved one. I'm in despair. I don't know where else to go. So I'll come to you. I've actually got to go out and find other people and then bring them in. So no, I, I really don't have any sympathy. I think those are rationalizations for not having any kind of courage of conviction. That's what I think. Yeah, that's bracing, man. I, I, I love that. And, I, and when you mentioned the pastors and the churches, that's a, that can be a sore spot as well. I, I mean, you know, George Barna, the pollster, mm -hmm. said that only 19% of church-going Christians have a biblical worldview. And then, then he asked pastors, "Do you think there is? Do you think the Bible does apply to today's issues?" Ninety percent of them say yes. And then he asked them, "How many of you have ever brought this up with your congregation?" Mm -hmm. Only ten percent mm -hmm. had ever brought it up. So it's not a surprise that Christians don't know how to think biblically. But but you 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 talk a lot about this. Um, you know, I I call you a biblical worldview nerd because that's exactly what I am. We were thinking about this kind of thing all of the time. How, how do you understand biblical worldview and why is it essential, especially here as we stumble our way into the 21st century? I define it for my audience as how you see the world and your place in it. Um, I was broken hurt, I was broken on a human level that day in, Kemp, in Kansas City. But what stopped me from being a false convert is that I had to have my mind renewed. I'm just logic based. I didn't get a lot of emotional affirmation growing up. So I'm, I'm, I can be pretty Vulcan uh, in my approach to things. Um, and so I, I needed Christianity to win me over logically for it to stick. And what I found as I, you know, you read through a Quran, you study other belief systems. Uh, what, what you find is there's really only one on this planet that has sufficient, and I didn't say they were nice, I didn't say they were cozy. I didn't say they were comfortable. I didn't even say they're the answers I wish that they were, okay? I said they were sufficient. Yes. The only worldview that has the sufficient answers for why we are the way we are, what can be, why the world is the way it is, and what can be done about it. The only one is the biblical worldview. Again, those answers aren't easy, but they do sufficiently answer the three most pertinent questions in life. And so when I got started, you know, I, I got to go national because of the success I had locally in Iowa. And I had a group of businessmen come to me after some of that success where my influence had helped them uh, win some contentious elections. And they said, hey, you know, Rush Limbaugh got started by some investors, took a guy from Sacramento and brought him out to New York and thought they had something and we want to do that with you. And so when we started trying to uh, sell my show to syndicators and stuff, uh, we were just getting started around the country. One of the things I would say to them was, I want our show to do for a biblical worldview what Rush Limbaugh's show did for conservatism, where it broke yes. through the wall. And, and, and every local radio, ho radio station said, well, I got to get another guy. I got to get a local guy that does on a local basis what Rush does uh, to, to tap into that audience. I mean, Rush found a way to make conservative political ideology, which really isn't an ideology as much as an observation of history of the things worthy of conserving, right? He found a way with his talent to make this applicable, cool, chic, pop culture knowledgeable. I wanted to do the exact same thing and approach with a with a biblical worldview. And so before I came to the blaze, you know, I was syndicated by Salem, one of the that's the largest Christian media company in the country. They would put me on both their conservative talk stations and their Christian talk stations. And didn't, I didn't have to change my approach really at all. And I think that's, that's really the key that, that we have, a, we've, we've, we've done a lot about, we've heard a lot of the word relevant in the church since I've been a Christian, but often I think we are so relevant that we are relative. Like, like it's not that, not just that you relate to me, it's that, it's that I don't see you, you relate so well, you're not any different than me, right? Yes. To me relevant is where I can relate to where you are at but it's clear that there's something that's different from me and you. And it's not that I'm a better person than you. It's not that I don't have the same struggles that you do. 
I am a, I'm like Roman seven incarnate, Jeff. I mean, and what, and it really stinks because I'm really, I'm pretty, God has helped me to be pretty knowledgeable about the word of God, which makes Romans seven even worse. Cause I know better. I like know all the answers and yet I fall for the same lies and canards and fall into the same pits anyway. And then I want to beat myself up after it because I knew better and I justified it and I rationalized it. But, but it's, it's, it's how it's that level of honesty that I think that's how we relate to people that it's that, Hey, here are my struggles and here, here's where God both encouraged me and then elevated me. Here's where I fell short. You know, our, our kids are, our kids now that they're teenagers, they all know the truth. Their mom and her, their mom and I were not virgins on our wedding night. We were not believers. We lived together before we were married. Um, we weren't even virgins when we met each other. Here's all the here we've made upteen mistakes. Um, our kids know that if they ask the don't ask us the right questions. My wife does biblical counseling now. She's finishing her very last semester of masters at Liberty, and then she's taking it she before she starts a a job uh, with a therapist uh, company here in Des Moines. And one of the things we've told our kids since they've gotten older is, hey, now that you want to start asking the serious life questions, make sure you want to know the right answers because mom and dad are going to be really honest with you about those things. Wow. You know, and I think that's something, too, that the church is missing is there. I think we are projecting an image that we cannot keep up rather than projecting Christ and and how he's clean. He's the one that's that's responsible for whatever changes people see in us. Rather than a, rather than an image, and so it's it's kind of the worst of both worlds. On one hand, we're this Pleasant Valley Sunday that we can't live up to, right? Because what's going on behind closed doors? Humanity, life, struggles. That's what's going on, and we don't want to be honest about that and project that everything's great when you become a Christian. But then on the other hand, when when evil is as is is on the prowl as it is in our culture now. We're, we're nicer than God and we're no threat to it whatsoever. And then our people don't, then the people don't come to us because they feel as if we can't relate to them. Kind of rambling here, but let me use one more example of what I mean. Before I got saved, I was a huge horror film buff. I still keep up with the genre when it delves into spiritual themes because I'm fascinated by how the culture addresses those sorts of topics. And about 10 years ago, there was, there's, a, there's a genre of horror film called found footage. And the Blair Witch Project was kind of the first big hit movie like this, yes. kind of a, a movie within a movie, right? Is it real? Is it not? About 10 years ago, there was a, another extremely popular movie in this genre called Paranormal Activity. And the plot of the movie is a young couple shacking up together are haunted by a demon, a real demon, like right from hell. And, and, and during the course of this film, they start off denying that it's evil. They start off denying that evil even exists. And then when they begin to admit that evil exists, they go to academia to get a professor of demonology. They Google it. They go to her dad for some, you know, dad uh, advice. They go to all these places in the culture, Jeff, to get all these answers to this evil. Can you guess the one institution they never go to in the entire movie? Hmm. Church. Never go to church. The one that actually has the answer and the antidote for the evil that they face, right? And so we're so busy being relevant to the culture that when when but when stuff gets real, notice they don't turn to us. That's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. So there there in a biblical worldview, there's intellectual truth, the answers to the questions that we know people are asking. But there's also that relational truth, the ability to be honest with people about your story and relate to them in a very human way. Mm -hmm. At Summit, we always, we talk about the DNA of influence and I kind of have a picture of a DNA double helix and truth is one strand, relationship is the other, they intertwine together. Yeah. And yeah. it sounds like that's even how you do this through your show. You invite people to comment, you have callers, you have hosts and things like that to just make sure that those two things are always interacting. Yes. Uh, in previous generations that accepted there was such a thing as absolute truth, how you would con how you would have persuasion in an argument in previous generations is we would start with our rival truth claims and then have the evidence to reinforce. And then the last thing we would close with is the, is the personal testimony to, to make the emotional connection, right? That would be the censure. That's how we would close the deal. 
here's what we but we're living in an era now where we don't believe in absolute truth anymore so we actually have the paradigm i believe we have to start with the emotional appeal the testimony that's why i talk about my own past so often and then once you think i can relate to you on your level this is this is now when i introduce the objective truth claim and so i think strategically we have to do it differently in this era than we have in other eras of american culture and then I've always encouraged my audience to do something I call three-dimensional thinking. The first dimension is the foundation. Now, this is a biblical commandment. Know why you believe what you believe, right? Peter says that no, have a ready defense. And that's where we get the Greek word apologetics from, right? Yes. So that's the first dimension. The second dimension, so we go from foundation to, 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 to connection, right? So why do other people believe what they believe? The world that's around me, right? other, other people that have what may be uh, different or aberrant views of historical Christianity. Where do those come from? People that just openly oppose or don't believe in Christianity. Where do those views come from? All right. Because if I don't know the people that I'm called to interact with, I'm never going to, well, get to know them. All right. So that's the connection. The third, the third stage is where we get to persuasion. Know how, why, know why other people believe what they believe about what we believe. Yes. On a basic theological notion, we know, that reason people don't know Christ is they don't want to. They're sinners. They don't want to repent, such as once were all of us. That's the meta theme. But how does that apply to each individual? What justification do they use? For example, here's something you may not know is, was, was that woman abused by somebody in the church? And the church, and she reported it, and the church didn't stand up for her, but defended the elder or the man in good standing instead. And you see what I'm saying? This is where we get to empathy. This is where we get to persuasion. This is where we actually make a relational a relational connection. The God of the universe so desired relationship with us that he put himself into human form. He, he, he emptied his bowels the way we do, emptied his bladder the way we do. He slept, he hungered, he thirsted the way that we, he bled the way that we do. Think about those things in order to make that connection with us, he became as we are. And that's where we need to we need to emulate that in how we make connections with other people. Your your testimony is not something to hide away, but to me, it's something to parade in front and to let people know, hey, I have been where you are at. I know what I'm talking about. I may be wrong. I'm not always right, but I'm not. This isn't just a lecture. I, I've suffered. I've made mistakes. Some of the some of them even worse than the ones you're thinking about, Megan. Mm. So you're up. You're right there with the found the three dimensions again: foundation, connection, persuasion. And mm -hmm. you begin with your story, because it's your story, and and that vulnerability. Then sometimes it earns return vulnerability, so that vulnerability yeah. can kind of scaffold. Uh, Steve, yeah. I want to I want to. This may seem like a sharp turn here, but I, I, one thing that I that I want everybody to know who's watching this right now is that you've written a book called Nefarious Plot that is kind of like screw tape letters. Everybody watching this, listening to this, is a fan of C.S. Lewis. In fact, mm -hmm. we make up, we put quotes online. We don't know who said it. C.S. Lewis, have C.S. Lewis say it. The, <laughs> screw tape letters. So, so this book, Nefarious Plot, is like screw tape letters on steroids. Because you're yes. just talking about how Satan would tempt a man, but how he would tempt a whole culture and try to Correct. take it down. And then you, you recently yes. did a novella that follows along with that, A Nefarious Carol. But uh, just give us a little bit of, uh, you know, I, we've got the book. People will be able to see it. People will know about that. But I want to hear what some of that plot is because I just have the sense that a lot of it is unfolding in real time. So I was actually doing, I was in Washington, D.C. doing PR for another book. And I'm in the shower getting ready to, to go do this interview. And it's one of the few places where my phone's not ringing and I'm not answering it or I'm not being a dad. So I can think clearly. And this, this line just comes to me out of nowhere. This book is dedicated to all the useful idiots out there especially you is useful idiots that didn't know you were being used all this time for you proved to be the most useful idiots of them all, Lord Nefarious. Wow. And mustard seed, it's the dedication of the book. And I went and did the interview. I get back to my hotel room that night and I just start writing. 
And I, and I realized that I'm, I'm, I'm doing a level below what Clyde Staples Lewis was capable of my own knockoff cover band version, but this is a corporate version of a screw tape letters. And instead of an individual, uh, an entire culture taken down by a demon general named Lord Nefarious, who was tasked by the devil over a hundred years ago with taking down the United States of America, because next to the church, now I'm not saying it's a close second, it's space bar, space bar, space bar, okay? But next to the church, in the last century, America has been more of an impediment to his world plans than any other human endeavor on this planet. And so he wants it, if he can't get rid of the church, get rid of the knockoff, get rid of America. And so Nefarious was tasked with this. And in this book, um, he connects the backstory of heaven. Um, he, he seeks to answer questions that we have, which is, well, if they know they lose, why do they keep fighting anyway? He answers all of these questions in brutal honesty. And at times it is brutal. I, I created him as a compilation of Heath Ledger's Joker and J.R. Ewing. Oh, that's all right. Funny. So as a charming anti-hero to bring you in, to draw you in. And then once you're in, the nihilism begins. Once you're drawn in and you're trapped. And he really, and he, he rips the veil, pardon the pun, behind hell, how it operates, the way it thinks. And he puts this all into writing and connects dots. He names historical figures, movements, contemporary ones, how he did it to America. He doesn't pull any punches. And, in the, and he does it because he wants to, this is not, you know, the handlebar mustached villain. Now that you're trapped, let me tell you my plan. This is the guy. He's already scored the touchdown, brother. He's he's doing the chicken dance. He's spiking the ball. Your mama, it's in your face, okay? And the fact that you'll just sit there and be numb to it and won't even know how to process it is how he will convince his master, the devil, that the plan has been successful. And he lays this all out in great detail in a nefarious plot. And, and last year, we thought it would be fun to start going back through the book again on my show and I got to tell you, it's not fun because so many of the things that are in that book from five years ago oh are what's in America right now that it kind of freaks me out a little bit. Yep. Um, and then earlier this year, I got the idea to write a sequel book, and it's a novella. So it's meant to be read in a short setting. And it's called A Nefarious Carol. And this one is patterned after Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And now that Nefarious has been successful, the devil himself comes out with America taken down. He wants to use it now as the launching pad for the final stage of his master plan, where this, that the Antichrist will come from America. Before that to be successful, he needs a woman to give himself to her of her own free will or the ritual will not be successful. He can't impose on her. He can't assault her. He can't lie to her. He has to legitimately woo her to his side. And in the course of one night, a scared young woman as escaping a drug dealing boyfriend in a dysfunctional Christian home. She's all alone with no money to her name in this cash uh, out of pocket motel and it's setting that the enemy comes to her and attempts to woo her into following him uh and the confrontation that takes place in this room is essentially what takes place in the hearts of each and every one of us when the enemy comes to us depending on the form that he takes so nefarious plot nefarious carol and i know a lot of people are going to be wanting to to look at that i'd like to close our conversation Steve, with, with this question, because I know so many of the young people we work with at Summit Ministries, they're 16 to 25. They're in that stage where they are, they find these counterfeit worldviews very attractive, and yet they do feel that they want to make a difference. I mean, if you, if you could just give them a couple of sentences that would brace them up, what would you say? To the young men, I would say uh, embrace risk embrace maturity, step in to your ordained roles. You're never, you're, 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 it doesn't mean don't be prudent, but you're never really ready. And there's really never enough money to be a husband and a father. I make 10 times what I made when my wife made me. And I still feel like I'm in the poorhouse most of the time. Okay. So don't stop delaying manhood. Step into your masculine destiny uh, is what I would say uniquely to the men and to to, to, to either gender that is watching right now. What, what I would say is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be bold. I think one of the reasons we fall into these counterfeit worldviews, brother, is that 
we're not sure what we believe stands up against them. Early in, earlier in my career, I did over 50 appearances as a conservative contributor on MSNBC, which is like, you know, being thrown to the wall, essentially. And, and one of the reasons I did it is because I needed to know, do they, does, does the other side of this argument know something I don't know? What am I missing here? Because this seems pretty obvious to me. And what I found was there isn't anything else. That's why they call you names. They call you names in the hope that that will, that will cause you to either be unpersoned, as, or, as Orwell described it, by the culture, or will cause you as an individual to shut down and, and, and surrender now before it's too late. Be, the, when you get past the name calling, there's no other there there. There's no secret sauce. There's no secret formula that you don't know. There's no secret teaching or revelation that they're going to drop on. You're going to be like, oh, snap, I didn't see that coming. Nope. It's, 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 they come out of the bullpen with a 98-mile-an-hour fastball, but this Mariano Rivera doesn't have a cutter, doesn't have a curve, doesn't have a changeup. There's no other pitch. And so if you can stand there and put up with the name calling – and once they punch themselves out, you can rope a dope them. There's no other, there's not a, there's not a off speed pitch left. And when it gets down to real logic and real information and real truth, that's when you're the home team. Wow. Wow. So don't fear if you can get past the name calling, then you're, then you got it. I, I, it just reminds me that what it seems like the most common command in the Bible is do not fear. Yeah, at least it's one of them. If we could just yeah. remember that. Steve Dace, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your coming on the Dr. Jeff Show. You bet, brother. Thank you guys for having me very much. Really appreciate it. I loved our conversation with Steve Dace from Blaze TV. Let me tell you something. If we remember nothing else from this, remember this. Do not fear. If you can get past the name calling and people's attempts to shame you, you can be a person who makes an enduring difference in the world. Thanks for joining me on The Dr. Jeff Show. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Dobson from the Rebel Parenting Podcast. When my parents, Jim and Shirley Dobson, sent me to the Summit Ministries Worldview Conference when I was 17, we had no idea the impact it would have on my life. It changed me so much in two short weeks, I've returned every summer for 34 years. This summer, your student can attend an in-person conference. That's right, in person. Summit Ministries Worldview Conference challenges students ages 16 to 24 to think deeper about their convictions and their faith by engaging with today's top worldview thinkers and apologists. Can you imagine in person with other students learning about the Christian worldview? If not, they can attend Summit's virtual experience and it's amazing. Change your student's life forever by partnering with Summit Ministries Worldview Conference today. Find out more by clicking the link in the show notes.